If you want to see how much breath is the fundamental part of singing, you must listen to this episode. Internationally renowned tenor and master voice teacher Michael Trimble joins us today on a discussion about the importance of breathing in a way that engages great singing. You're listening to the Engaging Voice Podcast with Tara B. Each episode, Tara will bring you insightful instruction on the voice with interviews, technique, and training so you can have a tension-free, healthy, beautiful singing voice that flourishes and lasts a lifetime. Hello, friends. Welcome to this episode. I'm really excited for my special guest today, and I want to get right to it because you're going to love what he has to share. Michael Trimble won both the Metropolitan Opera Editions and the American Opera Editions in 1963 and made his debut in Milan at the Teatro Nuovo as Cavaradossi in Puccini's Tosca. He has sung over 60 leading tenor roles of the Italian, French, and German repertoire throughout Europe, Canada, and the United States. In 1990, Opera America recognized Mr. Trimble as the leading authority in the vocal training and development of young singers. He is an internationally renowned tenor and master voice teacher. Mr. Trimble has had 62 years of experience performing, teaching, and artist training. He is recognized internationally as an artist teacher and repertory coach, and despite his attempts to retire, still maintains an active voice studio and vocal consultation service. His students are singing in opera houses throughout the world. And with that wonderful resume, would you please give a warm welcome to Michael Trimble? Welcome. Well, thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> it's so nice to have you on this podcast. And, you know, I know that a lot of people, when they hear that someone is a full time musician or singer, they want to know some of the history of that. And so, would you mind just giving us a little bit of maybe your earliest memories of singing and maybe even how you loved it? <laughs> Well, I never, I didn't sing until I was 19. Wow. Uh, I never opened my mouth. And then one day I was taking a speech class when I was in college and, and the head of the music department walked in and says, we need a big boy to play the part of the slave in the Christmas <laughs> opera, Alma and the Night Visitors. And I said, oh, I'll do it. So he said, come by and see me this afternoon. I went by to see him. And he said, you're going to have to sing a couple of lines. I said, what? He said, sing a scale for me. So I sang a scale and he said, holy cow. He said, you should be here on a voice scholarship, not a football scholarship. I was playing football, right? Wow. Was a football player like, who, who, who liked to, you know, those, those speech classes and a lot of acting. I actually got two, two acting scholarship offers to, uh, to uh, Northwestern and to Baylor. So, wow. and, and that's sort of where my interest was. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I, I, I sang one <laughs> scale and I was infected with the, with the singeritis, you know? <laughs> But the I first great that. singer I heard was was Cesare Sieppi and had this tremendous bass voice. Of course, all I wanted to do from then on was be a bass. So I actually sang as a bass for a while. Right? Wow. Yeah. And then I met a professional singer and he said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. He said, put your head up when you sing. So I put my head up and uh, there was no sound. I said, there's no sound. He said, because you don't breathe. That's when I started hearing things like the bigger the drum, the bigger the sound. He said, if you want, if you want sound, you have, to have, you, have to, you have to breathe. You have to have a bigger air bucket. So you wow. can't just sing, you know, off the, uh, just sing on your throat. So, of course, I've been making everything with my throat, with my bass voice. So, right? sure. so I took a breath. And sure enough, this very light, high, you know, tenor, sort of picking up a little color. And then uh, all of a sudden, I was singing the, the, the leads in the, in the opera workshop. <laughs> Switched my major from, from geology to, to, uh, to voice. Wow. Imagine. And that's the way I got into it. And then I do, did competitions. I always did well. You know, tenors, have, frankly, between you and me, tenors, I'm six feet tall and uh, had a, you know, looked a pretty decent figure. So uh, when you walk in and you're a tenor, they say, okay, uh, you're, you're in next. <laughs> you know? So the, the tenor, tenor life is very easy for career and very difficult for training. Singer, tenors are the hardest to train. They really mm -hmm. are. And uh, but once you have trained one and he, he can get them, to take his high notes and survive the the I mean, you know, I did Meistersinger von Nuremberg. It's five and a half hours long. And the big aria comes at the end. So stamina is a big problem for the for leading tenors, especially, you know. Yes. Yes. I would believe that. 
And I sang uh, Don Carlo, that's 49 high B flats and nine B naturals and about 200 high A's and nearly all of them are bangy. And I sang it 24 times and dropped it. I said, I'm not going to sing it anymore. It's too much work. Oh, <laughs> wow. I can save my energy to do, to do, uh, to, to do some of the ones that, that, that were easier, see? And it's wow. funny because I was known as having a very easy uh, top, very easy upper voice. I used to do Rosen Cavalier tenor and stuff like that, where they, they, they didn't have anybody else that could sing that stuff. And I could always sing it because it was high. But my voice wasn't very light. I mean, I mm-hmm. sang Wagner after all. I had a sort of a middleweight uh, kind of voice. But for some reason, I could sing high notes, I mean, extreme high notes. So uh, I, I sort of got, for a while, they were giving me all the extreme high note parts. And I wasn't getting offered any uh, standard uh, repertoire. So oh. I said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll sing, I'll sing this for you. If you give me, you know, four bohems and four rigolettos. And then they started, <laughs> they started bargaining. So I got some decent repertoire back, you know? Wow. So how did you then keep your voice healthy through that whole time? Because I mean, seriously, that's, that's a whole lot of singing. And- it was, it's a, you, you, and I was in the German system, which means you sometimes rehearse all day and sing every night and then travel overnight to get back to rehearsal the next morning in another place. And then you perform that night. And of course I was doing big operas. I was doing Carmen and Queen of Spades and uh, you know, all the big sort of uh, long dramatic roles. And uh, the, the secret is doing what, doing what the great singers told me. I did, I, I was very, I studied, started out with Olga Rees and Matt Carroll, who were both uh, professional singers and mm-hmm. big repertoire singers, especially Olga Rees, sang a lot of Aidas and stuff. And then from there, she sent me to Frederick Dahlberg, who was the leading bass in Germany. And then from there, I got into Richard Tucker, Mario Delmonico. I even had three lessons with UC Birling. I studied with Helge Roswanger for a year and a half and, Mel- and Lauritz Melchior for about five months. So all these great singers, all they talked about was breathing. So mm-hmm. they said, breathe, breathe, breathe. So every time you start saying, wait, 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 no, no, you got to breathe this way. And every time I did that, you know, the first time Richard, the first time I sang for Richard Tucker, he said, get a good breath under that. <laughs> <That's the first. laughs> so if you do that and the breath stay, look, nothing goes through your throat except air. So if the air goes through your throat, uh, you're in trouble. If the air does not go through your throat, but it's converted into sound, you can sing literally all day, every day for a lifetime and never have a vocal problem. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Cause I, I had just heard an opera, um, at Minnesota opera just the last weekend and it was Strauss's Electra and the main soprano part, she's on stage the entire time. And yeah, it, it almost seemed more, yeah, it seemed more Wagnerian to me anyway, but it, yes. it just blew my mind to think that she was, um, the kind of notes she was hitting and her voice was so strong, even at the very end. And I, I love that. Cause it made me think, how healthy that was. No, it is. These, the, you either know what you're doing when you sing that big repertoire or you're not going to last. You can't stand it. It's just, it's just too much, too much going on, too much conductor, stage director, too many notes, too many words, endless text, right? And when you're doing this stuff and you're, you're, you're have colleagues, you have to consider, you have to consider yourself might've been rehearsing all day. So the only thing I think that saves me and it saved my students over the years uh, is, is a certain way of breathing. A kind of breathing yeah. that's described in Caruso's book. And it's very clear. And it's what I was taught by these great singers. I've got, you mentioned Electra. I've got a student who's, got, who's on YouTube singing. Uh, no, it's not Electra. It's uh, Salome. Sorry, Salome. But she sings Electra in Brunhilde. She's 70 years old. She's still singing. I mean, great. Oh, I love it's it. Fabulous, right? So yeah. uh, there's no reason for a person to have to stop singing. If uh, we are wind instruments and we have a reed. So, you know, that's where I, I learned the bigger the drum, the bigger the sound. If you want more sound or need more sound, you have to be able to breathe much deeper and much bigger. And it's not done overnight. You have to develop mm-hmm. your being. So nearly every great singer in history started out as a, some kind of light lyric singer. Even Lawrence Melcher was a lyric baritone. So he sang mm-hmm. lyrically long before he turned over to, to that big Heldon tenor he became, see? And but uh, Caruso sang Barbara Seville, Lizzie D'Amore, and Rosvanger sang all the light Mozart parts, and they all sang very lightly. And gradually, over time, uh, Francis Rosvanger did uh, yoga three hours a day. Robert Merrill did yoga two hours a day. Caruso and Corelli were fantastic ocean swimmers. So was Joan wow. Sutherland. Joan Sutherland, Nellie Melba were ocean swimmers, and Flockstad was a long distance swimmer in the lakes in Scandinavia. You will not find, I played tuba, right? I mean, you, you think how they, Fritz Wunderlich played French horn. I mean, you, you don't mm-hmm. find these singers who, who, who do well for a long period of time who, who uh, didn't do something exaggerated in their breathing. It's just that simple. The breath makes yeah. the voice or it kills the voice. It's your worst enemy 
or your best friend. So a lot of singers, uh, I mean, a lot of coaches will say, and they're, they're right. They'll say, don't breathe. Because they hear you breathing in a way that's, uh, that's moving up against the throat and, and causing you to be tight. Uh, mm-hmm. What they should do is say, breathe more, but uh, don't let your throat get involved. Your throat is stay relaxed. So the whole mm-hmm. idea of breathing is to relax your throat, your jaw, and your tongue. The famous English soprano Ava Turner, who did the first tour in 1923 in, in, uh, in uh, England, did master classes at the Metropolitan Opera when I was in the Met School. And she came and she said, you darlings, you must sing with the invisible throat, the invisible jaw, and the invisible tongue. And the way you get it invisible is by breathing way down low in your back. And every time you inhale like that, your throat will relax. It's an opportunity to relax your throat. And I practice that. And uh, I'm 81 now, and I'm, I still have fun singing every day. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I hope I'm 81 and having fun every day too singing. (laughs) I do. So I'm, you know, so you had all this great success as a singer. And when I see like over 60 leading roles, that's amazing to me. But when did you start or did you have a time of transitioning to being a teacher or was that part of your life? Well, I was always a teacher. I taught my little friends how to play marbles, shoot marbles. When I was a little, when I was whatever, six years old or something, I was teach, always teaching something. Yeah. And, you know, it's, kind of, it, it's a long, uh, uh, I have a long uh, list of family members and, uh, you know, people in my uh, heritage, all who were teachers of different kinds. Mm. So uh, it's some, I guess it's DNA. <laughs> I don't know what it yeah. is. But I, the biggest thrill in life to me is to impart information. I would love to know something and be able to tell you. It's just exciting to me. I remember Edward R. Murrow, an interview, Edward R. Murrow said, the, he said, the most exciting thing in my life is for me to know something. Nobody else knows it. And I run around and I announce it to everyone. That's my greatest thrill. <laughs> well, if I can, I, I love to help you. My father was a charity doctor. He worked for everybody and, uh, you know, and didn't get paid, did all this charity work and did it because he really wanted to help people. And I think it's DNA. I really think it, I always wanted to help people. So I tried to start mm-hmm. these various programs I started just trying to help people. It, it's, it, it really is. Uh, the old rule was no action in the throat and no change mm-hmm. of emission. So once you start singing and your throat is totally neutralized and your jaw and your tongue, then you have to maintain your breath control. And the breath, as, uh, as Richard Tucker said to me, saying a fantastic high note for me, he said, you see, the voice does nothing. The breath does everything. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've been trying to spend my life uh, doing. And so far, it's, it, it, I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> I love that. So when you talk about no action in the throat, how do you get it neutralized? How would you describe? Breathing. Okay. You breathe. You, you, there are several ways to breathe, but uh, the one that Caruso recommended was one that Lily Lehman recommended, which is pull in the abdomen and breathe way down in your lower back. And of course, now it is sort of accepted to push the stomach out when you breathe, which was considered, if you knew that, the voice gets nasal. If my voice gets nasal, when I get to the upper register of my voice, I have to modify. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to lift my soft palate or something. But if I breathe behind me, uh, then my, my, my voice goes into the true mask above the nasal cavity, and it's more in my forehead. When it does that, then I don't have to do anything to get the high notes. I think the high notes without any action whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I'm maintaining, uh, always copy everybody. And Caruso said, you maintain the open throat through the power of the respiration. Mm. He also said, uh, what he called, you needed massive respiration is required for great singing. I mean, these guys didn't fool around. They breathe and breathe and breathe. But when you do that, your throat and jaw and tongue relax. And then you have automatically created an action reaction system that where the voice goes up into the into the forehead uh, or the resonance does it gets out of the nose and all of a sudden you don't need all of that uh, palate lifting and all that processing that people have to go through yeah. uh, to get to get a high note if if i sing in my nose i get up there i have no room i have no room for my high notes if my if my if i'm in the m let's call it the m resonance if i'm going ma 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 and i go ma 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 i'm choking to death i have no room yeah but let's say I do Bob, which closes my nose. I don't know if, you're, if we can do that on the radio, but the point is the, the space for my high notes is automatic because I breathe a certain way. Mm. So it's affecting, you're saying, all of by just the way that your inhalation, is it, is it just your inhalation or is it also the way that you are maintaining the support? Well, I would say I continue uh, the feeling that I'm inhaling. 
Mm. But, you know, Frances Lily Lehman called it a breath stop. She said, turn it around and go, huh, and really place it. So Manuel Garcia called it the miniature cough. There are a lot of names for this, uh, for this, uh, 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 they call it, it's the Valsalve maneuver, which is to exhale and, and then stop the breath suddenly. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of singers hold that stop on the diaphragm. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the miniature cough, <coughs> ah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Caruso used what he called the contrary motion, which means you inhale and you exhale. So I breathe in and then I go, ah, 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 ah. Tito Skip and Claudia Muzzo used what they called the sigh method. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you go, ah, but all of them breathe in the lower back and built up a reservoir. Manuel Garcia called that the super abundance of the breath. Mm. If you breathe like crazy and you, and, you're, and you have in your back and when you breathe in, you, you're, it relaxes your throat. All you do is make sure, you know, a lot of singers use, used to use the candle flame in front of the mouth. And if the flame moved, you were wrong. Uh -huh. Then the tissue, tissue paper was invented. So people started using tissue paper. If I put tissue paper in front of my mouth and I say, to be or not to be, that is a question. And the paper moves, then I'm, I'm wrong. The paper must not move. I remember a God little freak, a famous German bass said, we, we we're all trying to sing like we're underwater and we don't want to make any bubbles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's try that. We'll try anything. So mm -hmm. uh, all you do is, is uh, make sure you don't leak air. And if you do that, the only any air that leaks comes through your, your, your vocal folds and can absolutely destroy them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you distort the throat or something and – we live by the third law of motion, which is every action uh, has an opposite and equal reaction. Right. If I make an action, there's going to be a reaction somewhere. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is make an action with my breathing, and the reaction is total relaxation of my throat, jaw, and tongue. So my, 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 the, my, my jaw, it's like my jaw doesn't exist. Uh, some people use snoring. You go, and the whole throat, everything relaxes. Then how do you sing? Ah, if I have that little uh, tissue paper from my mouth, and I don't let it move. Guess what? I have to sing somewhere down at Caruso said, you feel the tone vibrating all down inside your body. Rosa Poncel said to sing deeper and deeper and deeper. In the interview, she said deeper three times. I wondered how deep she was by the time she got to the third deeper. And Kirsten Flock said, said she felt like her voice came from the center of the earth. Mm. That's pretty deep. Yes, it is. That's getting down there, right? <laughs> I I get the picture though. So yeah. So as you're describing this with that the that feeling you said like actually in your lower back is are you are oh, you yeah. talking about like even where the rib cage meets up in the back that you feel that there? Even below that. Even below, below that. that. You know, I, I remember I I sang for Helga Hegel also. He kept saying, where are your flanks? Where are your flanks? You do nothing in your flanks. Your flanks are numb. Your flanks are dead. What's going? So all he wanted me to do was breathe in a way that that, that opened up my lower back. Sure. And Caruso said it works just like a bellows. It opens up in the lower back and squeezes together when you sing. Mm -hmm. So there, you keep running. I mean, I used to interview, and I've got a book out called Fundamentals of Great Vocal Technique. And in that book, I quote, uh, I either discuss interviews that I had with great singers, or I quote great singers as far as I can find their material. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's no doubt about it that the great traditional way to sing was to breathe way down low in the back and then lean the breath against the diaphragm on the front. And the great singer described that. Tetrosini called it uh, the breath prop. She said it's like propping a ladder up against the wall. You breathe way down your lower back, and then your air column leans over and it's propped up against your sternum like you lean a ladder against the wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, what's her name? Lily Lehman simply said, pull in your abdomen instant before you breathe and fill up your lower back and then, uh, and then do the breath stop when you start to exhale. And the breath stop, she said, it's like you put your finger in the dike and you go, huh, and you stop it. So you'll hear singers going, huh, before they sing. Uh, one of the famous vocalists is, is Hala, and people use it all the time. Hala, and you hear this grunty, little funny grunting sound. Ah, 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 on the cutoff. And a lot of Italian singers, especially Poncel, Caruso, Tetrosini, just the greatest ones of all, right? So, uh, but I was so fortunate. I mean, you know, when, you, when you work with someone like Richard Tucker, you're in awe because uh, he could do anything with his voice. He could do anything. He's the best lyric tenor I ever heard and the best spinto tenor I ever heard. It was fantastic, you know? 
And of course, you had you had uh, Mario Del Monaco had a voice like a house. I studied with him about five months, and the voice was monstrously huge. And he would say things like, "Always save a leg, always save a leg, and never stand on the two feet. Always stand on the one the foot, and when not the foot to get tired, switch your feet." Right? <laughs> Love so that. You're always you're always thinking constantly. What do the professional singers do? The real professional singers who sing these monster operas for fifty years. Uh, Mario De Monaco sang Otello 467 times and never had a vocal problem, plus all the other massive repertoire he sang. Well, he would demonstrate bouncing staccatos on his sternal notch. So there's that, that hole right at the base of your throat, right between your, your, your collarbones. There's a big, like, a, a, a pit, a, the pit of the throat there. Uh-huh. And he would go, oh, 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 oh. That's how he demonstrated. And I studied with him, see? Of course, I was a lyric. T- 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 no. But on the other hand, if I could do that, then everybody would go crazy. So I had the strength to sustain that. And then you begin to realize, wait a minute. If you're going to hold some of these fabulous positions, like these fabulous singers, you better have fabulous breathing to go with it. Yeah. Because you can have so much breathing, but when you when you when when the comp- necessary compression happens, the the air you, the usable air you have gets much smaller. So you got to have, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Lamperti said. Uh, Always breathe so that you're one year ahead of the repertoire you're singing. Right? <laughs> I like that. So I like that. No, everybody, everybody talks about that. That was my experience. I mean, let's say I started with, with uh, I remember at the Metropolitan Opera when I was in the school there and I was whatever, 21. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met Giovanni Martinelli, who was 77 and taken Caruso's place at the Met and was a monster dramatic tenor. I mean, his voice, they call him the hammer. His voice was so huge. So I said, what did they teach you 60 years ago? Yeah. Man, this was what, 19? I mean, this is 1961 or something like that, you know, and he was already 77 years old. And he said, he put his hands on his lower back, right? Mm -hmm. And said, qui respirare, here, breathe. And then he put his hands on his, uh, right below his sternum, Uh right in the pit of his stomach and went, e qui postare. And he said, and here, place the voice, place the breath. Mm. So this is what I ran into constantly when I talk to the great singers and when you work with some of these singers, I it, mean, it's unbelievable what they do. There's some of them, it's all they do is breathe. Burling, I had three lessons with Burling. He couldn't explain anything except the way he breathed. He didn't have a clue how, how and he's a, probably the, the most fabulous tenor I ever heard and, you know, vocally and technically he could sing just magnificent, beautiful tone and it always seems so easy. But when you talk to him about singing it, all he talked about was breathing. There was nothing else to talk about. Yeah. You know, you know I, I had just read uh, the book, Great Singers on Great Singing by Jerome Hines. And oh yeah, yeah my buddy. Yeah. Jerome, my buddy. <laughs> and I, the same I remember that too. That's so much of what I heard throughout most of the singers had to do with breath. Breath, 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 breath. Well, Jerome Hines is a very so Jerome Hines used what's called the Miller maneuver and did it for over fifty years. That means you suck in the air through a half closed glottis and you go. <gasps> Ah, and he used it constantly. He taught it and did it in master classes. Then the Franco Corelli in a master class did exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. Somebody asked Corelli in master class, how do you get your, he kept talking about the open throat. And he said, how do you get your throat open? Somebody asked Corelli and he said, like this. He said, ah, ah. I said, now you understand. <laughs> wow. So say, I have a question then, Michael, because, um, if you're talking about, you know, this breath capability, which I actually agree with you because I see how relevant it is and, and you know, as a wind instrument, because that's what supports it. But I'm just thinking, kind of thinking out loud here, but people that, like, I've always thought to myself, like, I have more of a lyrical, I'm a lyric mezzo-soprano, but I've, I'm just thinking about voices, you know, and how we see some that are seem bigger and some don't seem quite as big. With the breath, are you saying that pretty much anybody, you know, I'm saying if you're trained and you have that ability to connect with that, is, is, does that make the possibility, I guess, of singing like for, for anybody that singer is that their voice can be rich and full and big, or, I mean, is there still different things that make variations between the voices, even with the body structure or the facial structure? Do you know what I'm saying? Well, the, it, it really is breathing and phonation. If the phonation is, you know, for instance, I, I, I'm from Texas originally, and where I come from, they talk like, well, everybody's talked like that there. How you doing? Sure, nice to see you. 
Now, my phonation is now shallow. Ah, you know, yeah. it, it all comes out of Ireland and Scotland. So if, if you go to Ireland, they say, hey, top of the mind, it was your father. Yes. If I sing with that type of phonation, the voice says, ah, right? Yeah. So we're supposed to figure out the phonation and the best one that we know of. It's been the Italians for years and years and years. Uh -huh. And you hear the Italians speak and they say, damma la tazza caffè. The one that Caruso used was the baby's cry and talked about it. He said the ah vowel is very far back and low in the throat. Well, when you cry like a baby, you go, ah, ah, and you try to reach down your throat and find your ah vowel, you realize that your ah vowel is way down in the back of your neck somewhere. See? Mm -hmm. So I knew singers like Joan Sutherland and Frank Corelli who actually used that approach of singing in the back of the neck. Caruso talks about it. He told Rosa Poncel to keep a rectangle at the back of her neck, all, a soft rectangle at the back of her neck all the time. And there was a certain, but you're supposed to create it by breathing, never by stretching the throat or yawning. Or do, remember, yawning is not, it's not an open throat. It's a spread throat. Right. So how about my throat? Through breathing. So once I get a breath, I go, and now my throat's wide open. Now I'm going to say, vogliamo andare nella città per comprare qualche cosa per mangiare stasera. And look how many vowels or how many ahs are there. Ah. Mm -hmm. Then you sing through that as if your ah were a megaphone. And you go, ah, a, e, o, u. Your throat stays totally neutralized. Yes. And you form everything through this ah you created by breathing. This relaxed ah is created by breathing. Mm -hmm. And some are better than others. Some are a little shallower than others. Some tend to, 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 to sing darker vowels than others. But, you know, if you, it, it enables you to sing languages without any accent if you can figure this out. Because the, the, what everyone is doing in trying to learn these languages, especially diction classes without speaking them fluently, all of a sudden you're forming all these vowels and things in your throat. Can you imagine where I come from? We have no ah, no o, oh, and no oo. Mm -hmm. and, and that we didn't have an oo. In, in, in my language, we say e because it comes from Scotland. How are ye? Right. So they, we, there are still people in Texas who say, "How are ye?" I'm going down. I'm going down downtown. Down. Ah, yeah. See, <laughs> how do I say, I'm going downtown. Imagine if I want to. What if I want to be a, you know, an English classical actor? Want to go to Germany, uh, to uh, London, and study to be a, a Shakespearean actor? How would I have to phonate my vowels? I'd have to go. A, E, E, O, U. I couldn't go A, E, E, O, U. See, I can't phonate wrong. The Germans, a lot of people just try to imitate uh, an East German accent or a Prussian accent. So they speak to German like this, you know, very, 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 ah. But that's not the way the Germans speak either. Yes, not my German. That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> And if you're saying, friend, the, the beauty of the, uh, the, the megaphone in the throat that is created when you take a deep breath is you can say, you can sing any language there. You take a deep breath, you go, right? Yes. You say all the languages within that form, and the form is soft and relaxed, and your tongue is totally relaxed, and you don't have to do anything except breathe. Mm. And that's what we've talked to the singers who've lasted for a long, long time. They are not busy in their throats. I mean, I have, I have really personal friends, colleagues who've literally damaged the nerve in their voices from, from, from flipping the voice, hooking the voice, and the voice absolutely gets broken and ruined. Mm -hmm. And uh, even Corelli, Franco Corelli, as great as he was, when he switched over to sing those big dramatic parts, like you started, it was learning Otello. And he switched over to the bowing the neck method. Well, when you bow the neck method, you, it changes the whole shape of your throat. If I'm going, if I bow my neck in the middle of a scale, you can hear if I go, ah, and it puts a kind of an artificial, what I call artificial darkness. Mm -hmm. In other words, it distorts the phonation slightly and makes the voice sound a little bit heavier, a little bit darker, but it can cause, uh, if the breath slips and hits you in, in that throat, let's face it, you're, you're going to suffer nerve damage, and that's what happened to Corelli. Wow. Let's, let's go to Adele. Adele, the big pop yes. singer in England, yes. right? 29, she's, she, they're going to give her the second surgery in her vocal cords and her career, she's retiring. Now, all you have to do is give her 30 minutes of exercises with the tissue paper in front of her mouth and tell her to stop leaking air and she can have her big career back because all she does wrong is she leaks air. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you get someone like, like Ray Charles, a great singer who's had a long, long career. And you listen to him singing, you say, oh, woman, oh, woman, where your dream is so mean. Listen to his voice. The voice is going, ah, oh. it's not interrupting. Right. He's not going, oh, woman, oh, woman. 
He's going, oh, 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 oh woman, why are you dreaming? And he does it all naturally, and his voice has lasted forever. Yeah. And we all love it. Well, that just seems like I. what I'm hearing is that it seems like that phonation is just continuous, that there's not, it like is. you're saying, Absolutely. not leaking like with Adele. I, I get that, and I hear that in a lot of pop singers where – the breath will even, or the voice will even sound breathy a little bit or crunchy or something. And that just makes sense with that it's leaking. We just have to remember the third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You do anything in your throat, it's going to react in the breath. You do anything wrong in your breath, it's going to react in your throat. Mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. So one of my questions for you actually is, you know, when you have a student come to you, because I know that you're still coaching and teaching and, you, and according to your bio, I know you have students that are in, you know, operas all over the world. How, what's the kind of thing that you do to assess them or see where they're at? What, what, what do you look for in them? Cause we've talked about breath a lot. So well, look, uh, look at it this way. We're going to have uh, a contest to see and hold a bucket of water out in front of them the longest, right? Uh huh. Now, uh -huh. think about it. You're going to hold that bucket of water with your arm extended, which means you can't help. You can't lean over. You can't use the other arm to help you or anything. That is a particular kind of sustaining ability. It's an isometric exercise. If you did it, and you did it all the time, like the, like the great kung fu fighters, right? That's what yeah. they do. They hold a bucket of, of, of cement out on each side and run up and down planks the tops of walls and back down, and they have to hold these things out. Well, think of the strength you develop, not just strength, but stamina, endurance, the ability to contract a muscle, in this case, the diaphragm, which is the uh -huh. biggest muscle in the body, and you're going to contract it. It's going to maintain its contraction when you need it for as long as you need it. So when you are testing singers, I've got I've got a tenor right now that's got the voice of doom, uh, and he's a friend. He just got he's he's got a, some big stuff going in Europe now. And it's but it's a real Siegfried voice, a big voice, a real mm -hmm. dramatic tenor, a real Helen tenor. Now. Now, the problem he had, he weighed 320 pounds. I've had him on a diet. He's down to 260, right? So he's lost about 65 pounds. So the big problem we have there is endurance. So I got him hiking and walking long distances and doing things to develop uh, his endurance because once I start singing, what do I do to not get tired? It's just that simple. If I get tired, other muscles will step in and try to help me hold that bucket of water out. My left hand will go under my right arm and try to help my right arm step. Then I'll lean to the left. All kinds of things start happening. So when singers are inadequately trained or, or, or inadequately uh, strong, uh, mm -hmm. they use other muscles to get the process, to keep the process going. Meanwhile, we're supposed to breathe in a way where the body is almost completely dependent on the diaphragm and the and the uh, really the the muscles of the rib cage. Uh, and when you think of intercostal breathing, how you do it, you you breathe in and all the muscles in your rib cage expand. George mm -hmm. London used to say uh, he said in master class, but I was great friends with him, so I heard it over and over and over. And he used to say, nothing moves unless the breathing moves it. So you have people who hold the rib cage out open, and usually it's high and it's shallow right? And yes. they did not move the rib cage with breathing. So there's no activity down low. So you get that kind of neck tight uh, sound that's sort of I'm because the breath is so shallow. If I breathe up here in my, just in me, let's say from my middle ribs up and I'm taking a breath and I can't hold the breath up there, the voice goes, ah, if I can breathe way down low and, and, and pull in my abdomen and do it again, it's a completely wow. different sound because of the size of the drum. If I can make bigger drums, I've got two of them. We call them lungs. And if I can get them open, it's interesting. Tetrosini described her breathing. She said the first drop of air goes into the lower rear quadrant of the lungs. Then you fill them from the bottom to the top. Mm. And then you lean the breath over against the sternum. But the whole point is that you breathe as way down low, and that opens up your 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 air buckets. Mm -hmm. And if you play drums, you know what I mean. The bigger the drum, the bigger the sound. You take the head off. A snare drum goes rat a tat tat. You take the head off that drum and put it on a Congo drum, some kind of big drum, and it goes boom boom. It's the same head, the same skin. You can even strike it the same way, but the sound right. is completely different because of the size of the air bucket. 
Yeah. And that's the way the voice where you shouldn't be pushing your voice. You shouldn't be using all kinds of other muscles. You shouldn't be lifting into the head. All these things you shouldn't be doing. You should take a breath. If, if a kid comes up to you and he's, uh, let's say, 14 to 15 years old and he sings for you and goes, ha, ha. Now you say, OK, now take a deep breath. He takes a deep breath and goes, ha, ha. Is that correct? Yes, because it's all the breath he can get in. He has no development, no training, unless he's been a swimmer or plays a wind instrument or something. He has no trained breathing. So when he breathes, it's what we would call shallow breathing. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's wrong. It means he hasn't got it anymore. So what did I do when I was in, you know, in, in college? I depressed my larynx and sang as a bass like that. <laughs> right? And one right. violin would play, and you couldn't hear me. That was the problem. That sound doesn't carry. And sounds that are that are what they call ingolata in in the throat, throaty, uh -huh. tend not to carry. You get them. Voices that are nasal, you can sing ma 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 and make it sound like you're really singing. I can sing like that. But if I close my nose, if I pinch my nose in the middle of that, it sounds like this. <laughs> my voice is in my nose and by the way if i succeed and sing that way you can barely hear me over an orchestra and maybe not at all or if you do hear me you're a little thin reedy sound yes <laughs> so if i do bob 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 instead of mom 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 and my my nose closes and the resonance jumps up in my forehead and then you can then you, you it sounds like gangbusters the back of the theater and someone like me, they always come to me and say, oh, my God, you're a real hell and tender. You can sing, uh, uh, would you do Tristan for us? You do, hey, would you do Tannhäuser and Siegfried? And I said, I was offered Otello when I was 26 to open the season in the Nassau State Theater in, I'm sorry, in the Heston State Theater in Wiesbaden, right? And mm -hmm. I accepted it. You know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And I accepted it. Well, during the summer, I hurt myself. I got a rib injury and separated my ribs. So I had to cancel. That was, uh, that was an injury from God, right? It saved my life, I'm sure, as a singer, because I was probably blown my head off trying to sing Otello. But anyway, I ended up singing the lyric part, Cassio. It's a light little part with a light little aria. And I got all the reviews. The reviews said, oh, my God, this beautiful new lyric tenor we've been, got in V-spot, blah, blah, blah. And I said, isn't that something? See? So some some things you only learn. Then you're up on the stage, and your your friend is sitting in the audience, and I'm doing my first Parsifal, and I'm in the staging rehearsal, and I go, Parsifal, and all the chorus members come and say, great, Mike, fabulous, and real hell, telling you, sound fantastic. Oh, keep it up, keep it up. And my friend comes back and says, uh, are you all right, man? Are you tired? I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. With your drum. I said, what? Wow. He said, you better rest. You better take it easy. So I said, okay. So we did the run through again of that big second act where I have all my singing. And so I'm just marking. I went, Parsifal. So all the chorus members come and say, good, Mike, rest your voice. Mark, just mark, rest your voice. Save it for the performance. And my friend comes up and says, holy cow, what did you do? I can't hear the orchestra. <laughs> Some things you only learn through experience, believe me. Then I was up there saying, killing myself, trying to make this big sort of baritone sound, and nobody could hear it except the chorus with me up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. I mean, you, you, the, the, you, you simply cannot sing uh, with any action in your throat. If you sing big repertoire, and you have to sing it for hours, which is what you do. I mean, look at Don Carlos four hours, uh, uh, the Queen of Spades, which is like singing Tosca six times, the big monster role, four hours long. Mm -hmm. The tenor never shuts up for a minute. He's singing all night dramatically, right? Mm. Well, you cannot do that stuff if you're, if you're working in your throat. Yeah, the, the it's, it will foul up the relationship between the the breath and your support and everything. And first thing you know, you're you're, you're lifting you're lifting refrigerators up there, and all they hear is a little maybe one little piece of ice. The whole idea yeah. is that you've got to get your megaphone open, and it's got to be free to run. The the first rule of singing used to be back when I was a youngster, and all these great singers. Uh, knew some of the old rules. Number one was no action in the throat, and number two is no change of emission. So I can't go to a high note and suddenly go like that and, and, and blow my air like crazy. Of course, I'm going to damage mm -hmm. myself eventually. That's a cat cat catastrophe waiting to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So the idea is to get a breath, take a deep breath, and then only down bow. It's like you're down bowing on the violin, but only down bow on one string and never up bow. If I up bow or back and forth, they go, right? 
Well, what if I only down bow? Then I get, and it all comes out legato. Now we're back to Ray Charles, who did it naturally, right? Right, so like right. There's supposed to be a continuous sound. One sound, not a whole bunch of sounds, that you sort of try to keep even. And you do it with breathing. Do it with the breathing. The breathing frees the throat. You maintain the open throat through the power of the respiration. That's a quote from Caruso. And you breathe and you breathe and you keep breathing and you never use your throat for anything. Establishing a free throat, according to uh, Dame Ava Turner, uh, is a technique into itself. If you can't, she'd say, you know, darlings, if you can't use your throat or your jaw or your tongue, you must use something else, mustn't you? That's <laughs> logical, isn't it? And yeah. of course, it was. <laughs> of course, if I can't use my throat or my jaw or my tongue, I've got to use something. Guess mm -hmm. what? I end up using down in my body someplace. We usually call it the diaphragm. <laughs> but if we get down in the diaphragm, you take a deep breath, and I'm going to be throatless. Then I go, ah, and I'm doing nothing in my throat. Literally, I can pull my tongue, ah, and wag my tongue, and my tongue has no role. Under my jaw, I go, oh, 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 oh. no tension anywhere from the neck up. And that's, mm -hmm. if there's a difference today, the way people teach today, they teach everything from the, from, oh, sing. They teach, for, they teach and sing everything from the neck up. You know, you've mentioned so many times, Caruso, what is the name of his book that, that, because I've never actually read it before, even though, of course, I know he's the great. I can't <laughs> think of the name of it. It's something like How to Sing or The Art of Singing or something like that, but okay. it's with, it's, Published by Dover okay. uh, with the Tetrasini book together. So if you've been in Caruso, Tetrasini, Dover, you'll find it. On, you'll find it okay. online. Yeah. yeah, and I recognize that publisher too. Yeah, that's it's it's just so good to know and to be reminded again of these singers from the past because, like you say, they're just there there weren't issues that it's it's funny you'd think that because like science in some ways we can see the voice now and things that would help that. But there almost still seems to be so many issues with the voice, too, you know. Well, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you make an action, if you pull your jaw down, mm -hmm. you know. I remember I had a, uh, I had a, a colleague uh, from New Zealand, actually, and he sang Tristan Isolde and Tannhäuser, these monster operas. <clears throat> and he sang with his mouth almost closed, sort of like Christa Ludwig, uh, Peter Glossop. A lot of the singers would sing, almost sing through a slit. The mouth was so closed. And I said, why do you close your mouth so much? He said, he said, you, well, it's, it, uh, well you, you know, mate, I, I want my resonance to go through up here, you know. But the problem is if you open the barn door, the cow will get out. <laughs> the idea is if you pull your jaw down, the voice goes under the mask. <laughs> so oh, it's, weird. So it, you're not supposed to open. Now, I can sing with my teeth together, too. But that's also wrong because that's also an action. If I pull my jaw down, it's an action. If I put my teeth together, it's an action. I'm not supposed to do nothing. I'm supposed to drop my jaw and let gravity open it for me. And yes. guess what? If I breathe and I drop my jaw, let gravity go, I go, ah, oh, 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 oh. I haven't used anything except my diaphragm. I have not used my throat or jaw at all. And that's yeah. so hard for singers to understand because they don't have any breath or have never developed their breathing. They're totally <laughs> dependent on action in the throat somewhere to create a reaction that will control the breath. I have a question because I would love to know or help people know about you and where they can maybe either study with you or get your book. And so I know you have the Trimble Vocal Institute. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and then how we can get a hold of you? Well, the Institute started out being uh, because I knew so many people in the business and not just, uh, 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 you know, people where you could do auditions to get jobs, but also we knew coaches and language teachers. There were teachers that really did teach uh, diction the way you need to know, the, you know, the high language on the stage, especially if you had to speak dialogue. And uh, so that was the original idea I put together. It was like the Aspen Vocal Institute that I started one in, uh, in the new school. Uh, for the arts in New Jersey. And uh, I've done it for years. I just try to do it to give the singers performance opportunities and to give them a proper education. So how can people get a hold of you or your institute? What are the best ways to do that? If they want well, to I'm on, uh, I've got a, I've got a website, uh, michaeltrimbletenor.com and I've got a YouTube channel and I've got, hmm, wait a minute, let me check with my doctor here, my <laughs> consultant. What is it, early? Michael Trevor Tenner. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. TrimbleVocalInstitute.com. Okay. And that's my website. I see, I don't even know those things. And then the, the YouTube channel is Michael Trimble Tenor. That's it, right? All one word. Okay. Well, I'll make sure that I post the links for people so that they can uh, get in touch. But there, you know, there, there, that's the, the email is what? Uh, TVI? TVI, dot, uh, TVI at B-I-W-I-F-I. That's Bainbridge Island Wi-Fi. B-I-W-I-F-I dot com. TVI at B-I-W-I-F-I dot com. That's, that's, uh, anybody can reach me there on the email. And I must say people send me, send me tapes all the time and I I do my best to answer them all and write them back as Mm -hmm. honestly and considerately as I can. And I can't get to everybody, but I, you know, when they ask me a question, I think like pertains to maybe every general problems, I try to answer every one of those. Can you just give me the, also the name of your book again to remind listeners? Fundamentals of Great Vocal Technique. Awesome. And that's on your website, I'm assuming? Oh, The Teachings of Michael Trimble, I think it's in there also. But anyway, it's okay. published by uh, by uh, Inside View Press. And uh, you can get it at, at Voxped, V-O-X-P-E-D dot com. Okay. Or at Amazon. Get it on Amazon. Amazon. Okay, awesome. Well, I'll put those links too. And there are three different versions of it. There's okay. even a Kindle version of it, right? Oh, wow. Then there's one that's all there's one with that's elaborated with all kinds of pictures and everything, and then just a plain paper okay. uh, copy. Okay. Well, that sounds awesome. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for your time oh, today. Hi. And You're so welcome. Well, and just sharing your experiences too. It's really fun to hear someone who's been involved in, you know, this field of singing your entire life and how much you've um been through, experienced through the years. It's just it's it's history, really. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, you're, you're welcome. Anything I can do, I'm very happy to do. And okay. that's, uh, I hope, I hope I did. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you so much and hope you have a great day. Okay, hon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. As you can tell from listening today, breath is essential to every part of singing. For more information on Michael Trimble and the Trimble Voice Institute, please go to TheEngagingVoice.com. Please share this episode with others if you have found it helpful. And if you would like to learn more things vocally and have a supportive community to do it in, just go over to Facebook and join the Engaging Voice Singers. We would love to have you there. And as always, I so appreciate you as a listener. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Engaging Voice. Tara is committed to giving you tools each week to keep your voice thriving. Join her next time for another valuable and informative chapter.